You can get the vinyl at Michael's or any of the craft stores. You buy it in the section where they have the silhouette paper cutting machines and the you know the vinyl machines, um, and it's a dollar ninety nine a sheet for twelve inches by twelve inches. It's you get it in the same place. This happens to be the silhouette brand that comes with the silhouette Cameo three vinyl cutter paper cutter combination. You buy it at Michael's, and the six foot roll is about seven dollars. So I mean it goes a long way. So that's not too expensive. So if you think about this project right here being a unique project, I mean you can make, I mean these mugs are a dollar fifty a piece in the vinyl at a dollar, at a dollar ninety nine a sheet in a twelve inch by twelve inch sheet, and realizing that your piece is going to be this small, it's a very inexpensive, very inexpensive gift. And I've kept it kind of light hearted, you know, with the love to scroll on there. But you can get this in this material, this vinyl material in gold, silver which looks great as a wedding, you know, decanter, or, you know, you could even put it on a wedding frame at the bottom of the frame. And that's kind of the whole idea is take this and run with it and do all kinds of other things with it. And if you think about how detailed you can do a scroll saw project, I mean, you can do, well, we can cut coins. I mean, and, and, you know, so that gives you an idea that you can get very detailed. Now, here's the negative about this project on the scroll saw as, a pair, as compared to on a vinyl cutter. If you noticed, my pattern, which we're going to show in the video here in a minute, is all one piece. So if I wanted all those letters to be individual letters, I would have to take and put each one on its own transfer and transfer it one at a time. Whereas with the vinyl cutter, you know, this is the reason I brought her up to do this was not to embarrass her, but just to show <laughs> that until you get the feel for getting this backing peeled off there, and I was a little worried about doing it myself because I brought my daughter over and all these mugs that we did, she did all those for me. Now, again, those were done with a vinyl cutter. The edge. There we she go. got it. Got she it. got it. it. So, instead of doing the edge, I think Larry showed me or Dan showed me you come in from the middle and just pick it. Yeah. It's called weeding. In the weeding. was something I learned. It's called weeding is what it's called. Uh, oh, do you really? But my daughter did all these mugs. But the neat thing is the scroll saw actually does a pretty good job as long as you've got, you know, the pattern you want to put on there. And it may be something just as simple as a heart. So go to Google, type in heart or type, in, you know, something very simple. Whoops, sorry about that. And you just line it up, burnish it a little bit. Yeah, don't pull it up once you get it no. down. <laughs> once you get it on there, it's on there. Yep. So anyway, that's all there is to that. So it's a unique project, something you've probably never done on a scroll saw, and it works. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you Inkscape, and some of you have probably seen this program before. It's a free program. It's available for the Mac. It's available for the PC. Uh, it's open source. It's very well supported. There's a million tutorials on YouTube for it, and it it's not the program I use to design graphics because I use a higher end program, but it's it's one that's available to everybody for free and it does work. And what I'm going to do here is just, it's again, this is not a tutorial, don't try to remember it. It's just a demonstration of how I made this little love to scroll pattern and made it to where it worked on a scroll saw. You ready? Yep. This is not going to be a tutorial as such, and it's going to be more of just a demonstration to show you this uh, program named Inkscape and why you need to have it installed on your computer if you enjoy using the scroll saw. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to make a very basic pattern uh, to use with the vinyl transfer uh, that we're talking about in the meeting tonight. You can find Inkscape at www.inkscape.org. It is free software and it's available for uh, the PC, Mac, and I believe it's even available for the Linux operating system. So uh, it's a fairly complex program, but luckily we only need to use uh, parts of it to design some of the basic patterns we may want. Uh, so take a few minutes to go over uh, to this website, download this, and then you can slowly become uh, uh, 
better with this software as you need it. Okay, what we're going to do right now is we're going to uh, create the uh, Love to Scroll vinyl transfer that we uh, are going to put on our little coffee mug. With Inkscape open, we're going to go over here and select our font selector right here. It looks like the little A. We're going to go up and select the font we want to use. In this case, I'm going to use a nice big bold font. It happens to be called Cartoonist. Uh, this is a font that I installed on the computer. Uh, if you email me, I can give you uh, links to a couple of good font sites. We're going to click on the screen. We're going to type the text on the screen that we want to put on our mug. In this case, we now have what's known as a text object. And in Inkscape, as well as most vector graphics program, a text object cannot be manipulated uh, quite as easily as a regular object. Uh, so in this case, we can stretch it. Uh, we can make it bigger. We can move it around the screen. We can do those kinds of things, but we can't um, use it to uh, weld it together or do other editing features that we, we want to deal with. Uh, and we will want to deal with those to make our label. Right now, if we printed this out uh, as a pattern and used it to make our vinyl transfer, each letter would have to be individually put onto a piece of transfer tape and then applied to the mug once, one at a time. And that would be uh, very tedious. Uh, so if you're going to use a scroll saw to use this vinyl transfer, uh, it's much easier to have these letters welded together as one object. And that's what I'm going to show you in this video. Just this, Again, this is not a tutorial. It's just a demonstration. So uh, don't try to you know, follow along too closely here. Uh, if this is something you all want to know, I'll put together a tutorial and put it up on YouTube. So right now, like I said, we have a text object. I'm going to go up to path and I'm going to convert this text object to a path. And again, I can go into details on what this means later, but basically I'm going to select right now object to path. Nothing looks like it changed on the screen, but it did. This is no longer a text object. It's out now actually just a regular vector object. Because of that, I can go up to Object, Ungroup, and now each one of these letters is an individual object that can be moved around. Okay, And the reason I did that is because I want to make all these letters touch so we can make one pattern out of them. So I'm going to select the O. I'm going to use my arrow key to nudge it over. Same with the V. Same with the E. I have all those touching. I'm going to do that with the, the uh, O, the C, the R. Let's move that back over just a little bit. The L's. And now each one of these is a group of objects. You can see this is these are four objects. Uh, the L is an object. The O is an object. Same thing with the, over here. We've got all these that are together as a group, and these are together as a group. To make these easier to move to, to move around, we actually want to weld these letters together. So I want this to end up being one object, this to be one object, and this to be one object. I can select. L-O-V-E with my pick tool. I can go up to object, uh, I'm sorry, path, union, and what union will do is turn that into one object. I'm going to do the same with the T-O. We have two objects. We do path, union, and it welds those two together. Same with scroll. We have f uh, six different objects. I'm going to do path, union, and now we have three objects on the screen that we can manipulate. We can also set the background color or what they call the fill color on each of these whoops, objects. And you may want to do this when you're before you get ready to uh, print the pattern out. We can set the stroke around the object to black so it looks more like a fine line pattern that we're used to cutting. So there are three objects, and you can now clearly see, since I made them gray and showed the outline, uh, that each one of them is an individual object. I'm going to take the scroll. I'm going to bring the two down and find a good place to rest it on the scroll. 
let's say let's move it over I'm going to use my arrow keys to nudge it over to right about there now I'm going to take the word love and I want to get it attached and I think to do that I'm going to rotate it so I double clicked on the word love I'm going to rotate it around like that use my pick tool to find a good place for it and I may want to use my arrow keys to move it around until I find pretty much what I want so I think that's what we'll put on our mug love to scroll now we're going to use that union tool one more time I'm going to take my pick tool which is this tool right here I'm going to draw a bounding box around the whole pattern you can see it shows a bounding box about each of the three objects I'm going to do path union and now we have one object on the screen that we can print out uh, apply this to the Baltic Birch sandwich with the vinyl transfer inside the sandwich uh, we can cut this out and then apply it to our mug so there is a very non-detailed explanation of how to put together uh, these patterns in Inkscape uh, again if this is something you're interested in I'll do a more detailed tutorial that you can uh, access on YouTube okay let's get back to the vinyl transfer so the whole intent of that is just to show you that yes that software is somewhat complex and if you're not a computer geek you might be intimidated by it and just one just one second but it's it's approachable because as pattern designers we only need to use a very small subset of the tools of this program we're just dealing with black and white we you know graphic artists deal with color color variations all kinds of things that we don't have to deal with we just want black lines and maybe a gray black background or in his case he wants red lines whatever so with just a very small amount of training on a complex program like this you can use it to at least get some usefulness out of it the other thing I do is every pattern that I put out I make sure that the actual pattern page remains a vector that's editable in this program so if you get one of my patterns and you want to add a name to it or if you just want to edit it go to this program right here hit import pick my PDF my PDF will import into this program and then you can change it any way you want so it's really handy once you just pick up a few uh, and like I said there's literally hundreds of tutorials for Inkscape online let me go here first quick, 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 just have, yeah as a um, capability I don't want to go and explain how but can you set it up so you can use the words to follow a line yep it's called text to curve and, and again yeah, it's a whole nother process. It's easy one, two, three steps. If you're trying to figure it out on your own the first time, it'll drive you crazy. You want somebody to show you how to do it the first time. But once you get the steps down, then if you're not familiar with this kind of software, write the steps down, just do the same thing every time. But yeah, you can do text on a curve, text on any path, basically. It could be a, you know, a squiggly or whatever. So yeah. Uh, what you, what you, the way you just said to import it into a vector from your prior PDF, Will that work to use it for a CNC machine? Yes. Too? Yeah. The, the reason, we're getting kind of geeky here. The reason I leave all my patterns as vectors, and, and if, let me go back and explain what that is real quick without getting too geeked out. There's two types of graphics program. There's a bitmap graphics program, and that's what you're typically used to seeing when you edit your photos in, like Photoshop, the different versions of photo editing software that's out there. And they work by turning pixels on and off on the screen. So if you have a line that goes from here to here, you draw a series of pixels from here to here, and if you zoom in on it, you'll see they start getting real stair-stepping. What a vector graphic is, this line right here is actually a mathematical equation, and it's an equation of two nodes, this node and this node, and what path does it take to get between those two nodes. Same with this curve. So every time you enlarge this pattern by grabbing this handle and pull it, every line in there is getting mathematically recalculated so you can blow it up 20 feet wide and the lines will be just as crisp crisp and sharp as they were at one inch whereas if you took a bitmap graphic and you blow it up you won't even be able to recognize what it is because it gets all distorted so that's why you use a vector graphics I keep all my patterns as vectors inside my PDFs because all the laser people out there that come to my site and all the CNC people they need vectors now the one thing that, that this program gets used a lot for is there's a lot of people out there that like to cut red lines instead of black line and you can import my patterns into this program and go down there and click with your right mouse button and tell it to do a red outline and then you've got a red outline pattern. So that's another thing it gets used for a lot. 
Is it basically uh, Apple can use is it Inkscape both? This Inkscape will work on the Mac, the Windows PC, all versions of Windows, uh, and it'll work on the the Linux operating system. So it'll work just about any platform you got. So okay, there's that. There's the basics of that. Let's see. Let me look at my notes real quick. Make sure I'm not missing too much. <clears throat> Inkscape demonstration. We did that. So that's pretty much vinyl. It's a unique. Uh, I think it's a unique technique for the scroll saw that I don't believe too many people have tried before. But just think about the possibilities that are there for vinyl and what you could use because these vinyl transfers that we're making can be this big. I mean, you know, you could put them on windows of cars. I mean, whatever you want. This is considered a permanent vinyl. Like I said, it does it does not say that you can put it through a, a dishwasher. But those mugs, um, I put mine through a dishwasher twice now, and it's fine. Uh, I have heard that if you get the, get this hot enough, it will come off. But dishwasher safe for sure. I think that's vinyl. Questions on vinyl? We good to go? While I'm putting this demonstration on, trying to think of what I'm going to talk about, I'm walking through these stores going, I can cut that, I can cut that, I think I can cut that. That's what it was happening, right? I'm looking for things to cut other than the norm. I was walking through Walmart, and I went through the section where they had the cutting boards. I found this cutting board for $3, $4 at Walmart, and I just simply took Inkscape, like we just talked about, and I customized it with my daughter's name. So there's a project that cost nearly nothing. You didn't have to come up with the board. It was already ready to go. And again, that's a craft market item that you could sell, you know, with custom engraving or custom um, fretwork of any type on it. And it's made out of bamboo, and I hate bamboo, but this cut much easier than any bamboo I've ever cut before. Bamboo splinters are terrible. I don't know if you guys have ever used bamboo, but you, put it, you get a splinter from the stuff in your finger, and the next day it's like you got stung with a bee. Maybe just because I'm allergic to it. But a very inexpensive project that you can cut on a scroll saw. And again, using Inkscape. It's a program that every scroller should at least try to learn the basics of. I think this was $2 at office at Staples. If you needed some hardwood to make those little books we talked about earlier, the little paper journals that I showed, here's some material you could use instead of the cardboard that's a little more durable. Let's say you wanted to make a journal that was, you know, five by seven or larger. There's a simple piece of wood that you can use, and I cut one of these up and it cut great. So this is just kind of extra stuff I want to throw in before we go to the next one. This is Corian. Corian is extremely hard to find in one quarter inch thick material. This I found is not cheap, but at least I found it. Uh, you can buy this at, at adventables.com. They're the people that make the x car scrolls uh, CNC machine. So I wanted to show that just because I was looking for materials to cut. Foam. Now this might be more of a kid's project. You've got your, your grandson or your granddaughter or somebody over in the shop. Pick up a few pieces of this foam and this stuff's like really cheap, just pennies a piece. Print you out a pattern for a visor, put 10 of these between two boards, cut yourself out about visors all day. And it, while you're at it, you can put the child's name on it right here. Just more ways to use your scroll saw that you may not have thought of. Okay, next material. High density foam. Looks like this. This happens to be the density foam with the sticky stuff on the back. That's it. Around. What can you do with high density foam? Make your own customized can cozies. Again, done on the scroll saw. This, anybody know what this is? That's a cozy clamp. That's a cozy clamp. <laughs> cozy clamp. What you do. You make it the one of these because they're really hard to glue together. And once you cut out your high density foam, the easiest way I found to glue these together is to get one of them started with this little hole drilled right here. Then you can use your clamp 
to hold this together and then roll your foam around it and you can start with your super glue. I, I use cyan, cyan, say that for me. Cyan, say, somebody say it. CA glue, yeah. And, and what I do is I put a little drop of CA right there on the corner. Get that piece started and let it, let it cure for 10 seconds. And then I just move down until I got it all glued together. And then the pattern that will eventually be on the blog, you know, the circular part for the bottom will be sized correctly. Now, everything you're going to see here tonight, with the exception of a few things that came from Walmart, came out of Michael's. Hobby has, Lobby has most of them. He has stock in that store. They do not carry different thicknesses in this high density foam. It's all one quarter inch thick. They do have some thinner stuff, but it's not called high density. It's that, you know, inexpensive foam that we were talking about here. Okay, here's something I think is kind of neat. Make your own rubber stamps with high density foam. You can take this one's foam, this one's different materials. You can take this foam and anything you can cut on a scroll saw, you can make a rubber stamp out of. And the foam material, I don't know if it's going to last a month or if it's going to last 10 years, but it's lasted for three weeks. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> and the foam's good because it rocks back and forth and you get a nice, good impression. Another stick, Another stick person. You can also make these out of, what do they call this stuff, linoleum. And this stuff works, but and this is one made with linoleum. And this is what you're supposed to use. But here's what I run into. It's hard. So when you go to stamp it onto the paper, it's harder to get a good transfer, but it does work. You just have to be... It usually works better if you have a stack of like newspaper. Right. That's, that's, why, that's why I've got this right here. And again, I got a poor transfer because I didn't have a very good ability to get pressure onto the block. You can do better with this, and I've got better. This is how I ended up. This was a little linoleum on this notebook, was about as good as I could get. This is a very clean stamp, and it was done in this material called Speedball. And this is carving material for stamps. It cuts great on the scroll saw. The only problem is you got to cut it 10 times because it melts back together every time you cut it. So this right here is a result of me pulling this one apart. So this is out of the speed ball, which is rubber stamp material. This one is again from the, the foam. And it's, it's a, the reason I showed this one is because it's a cutout. It's a solid piece with a cutout. So, something different to cut. Something something you can do with your scroll saw that you may not have done yesterday. And again, this one is personalized or customized with Lynette Woodworkers Association. Big stamp. And I did this one just so you could see you could add quite a bit of detail to it. This stuff right here, I bought four of these. I would never buy another one of these. Ugh. When you put a blade through this, I don't care what blade you use, it glues itself back together just as fast as you can cut. The heat, any heat at all, will make it fuse as soon as you cut it. So it works, but you can see right here, can you zoom in on this? To get this piece out of here is a challenge. That's what you got to do. So it's not, it's not worth the effort. The foam, <coughs> people don't traditionally use that for rubber stamps, but from what I've seen, it holds up really well. I've used these now a few dozen times getting the demos ready, and it, it's holding up fine. So, and again, this is another thing where scrapbooking is a, a huge hobby. It's way bigger than anything related to the scroll saw. So if you could find a source to make custom stamps for scrapbookers, I mean, they're going to they're gonna keep you busy. And you could cut four of these. I cut four of these at a time. That's the most I could cut without making a mess out of it. But four is not bad. This is how you would do the project. I took a piece of 
pine, cut a circle out, bought a knob at Home Depot. I've got my heart shape pattern, two pieces of Baltic burst plywood, my exacto knife and my foam. And again, this is the way I like to make sure that it all fits together good. Once I get my wood cut out that I know the size, I just put it up on the wood and I cut around it with an exacto knife. And this, this high density foam cuts very easily with an exacto knife. So now I've got the piece. I'm ready to stack it together. The other piece of wood, whatever. You should not catch that. There it is. So there would be our stack and our pattern. We cut our heart out. When we get, ooh, that didn't sound right. Cut our heart out. Once you get your heart cut out, then you take and just remove this, stick it onto your piece, and there's your stamp. Really simple. And you can make lots of those out of one sheet. Any questions on high density foam? Here's another one. And this, this is something that you can do fairly easy. This one ended up being a problem because it's backwards. When you make the stamp, you, it, I'll show you. I put it on upside down. That don't look right. <laughs> Backwards, so anyway. Yeah. <laughs> any questions on the phone? And does anybody have any other great ideas of how to use foam? There's got to be more ways that I can think of to use this stuff on a scroll saw. Uh, I can think of all kinds of little trinkets you can make with it, but uh, kids' project, this would be great for kids' project when you've got kids that come over, even just cutting out little figures to give to them, you know, dress up dolls or whatever. Coasters. You could also, you could also very easily cut out the alphabet. Oh, yeah, and there's so many things you can do. And you can get this high density foam with this sticky backing on it or without. It's basically about the same price. I got this off of uh, uh, Amazon. I got five sheets for $8, something like that. And these sell for $1.99 a piece at Michael's. And the colors are just black? They only have them in black. Uh, they do make it in color, but I, I didn't order them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then what I found is what, if you're making that little can cozy just going around, this type of super glue, can you get in here real close? It has this pinpoint applicator at the top. Works really well. As you push on this, and once the glue starts coming out, then you can put little dots along the edge of that can cozy, and this works great for gluing that, that together. That worked out really well. Is that a thin or a thick? This one, I don't know they even rate them. This is a home and office, you know, it's not like you'd buy at a woodworking store. So it's just typical crazy glue. I, I tried to use, I had some thin CA glue and I tried to use that just by wiping it on with a brush and I couldn't get it to bond. Even with the, even with the accelerator, it didn't bond, but this worked. Now I'm going to move on to what to me is the most exciting of all these projects and the one that's got me, my juices, creative juices flowing, uh, because I think this has some real potential. Leather, cutting leather on the scroll saw. The reason I'm so excited about this is because I can cut 5, 10, 15 of these at a time. Here is a little fancier than anything I would personally wear. So here's just a piece of leather that I bought at Michael's. I think it was $7 for a 12 inch by 12 inch sheet. I took a butterfly pattern. You can buy the, the snaps at Michael's also. Upside down. A piece of jewelry. Steve. Yeah. We've got a tandy leather outlet across the street. Yeah, I'm getting to that. I spent this afternoon there. <laughs> at, this one I got kind of dirty. At Michael's, you can buy kits like this, that already have the snaps and everything in them. These work great in that sandwich 
philosophy to customize with initials or names or decorations of any type. So you're ready to go. You don't even have to make up your own leather. I just leave, yeah, when I sandwich these, I put the board from here to here and I leave, leave the snaps hanging out. They also sell these little leather luggage tags and it's just a source for small pieces of material. Here's a little bracelet, a customized bracelet with my wife's initials on it. We'll pass these all around. I use the whole luggage tag, love to shop, that you could use as a key fob or a purse tag, whatever. Leather earrings. I mean, the, 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 really, it's unlimited. Now let's pass these around. This is a change purse that I cut on the scroll saw. Again, you can cut five or ten of these at a time. A business card holder cut on the scroll saw, hand stitched, and an iPhone belt holder. So pass these around. And I'm going to be coming up with a lot of different patterns for these. Here's something that's a little bit different that I did with these two. On this one I took two pieces of leather and I glued them together back to back, but I put the cutout on one piece so it looks like fretwork like that. So it makes a nice little key fob. And I like the fact that it doesn't go all the way through. And when you get done, the two pieces of waste wood are another key fob. This piece of black wood leather that I cut the uh, bracelets that's going around on, I think this was $10 for uh, 8 by 10 sheet or whatever size it is, so it's not cheap. This is leather that they sell for the Cricut vinyl cutter that you can cut on your, your silhouette or any other machine like that. It's like a, a, I'm starting to learn what leather is. This is like a two ounce leather. It's thin, it's what you're gonna see on the little uh, coin purse that's going around. This works great for that type of stuff and it's super easy to cut. You could easily cut 20 of these at a time. No problem at all, it just cuts like butter. But it, this you get at Michael's and it's in the section with the paper cutting machines the, and the vinyl cutting machines. But again, it's expensive. It's like $12 or $13 for this one sheet. But if you've got, let's say if you've got five of those coin purses out there, no, let's say three. If you got three of those current coin purses out of there, that's three gifts that you can give away that are customized with their initials or with custom graphics on it or whatever you decide to do for $14, $13. That's not bad. You know, it's not cheap, but it's not bad. When One thing you have to learn, let's see what I did with this right here is you have to learn to hand stitch that stuff, which ended up being a little easier than I thought it would be. They sell this wax thread, and they sell it in different thicknesses. And when I went to Tandy Leather, which is right across the street today, they told me that the thread I was using for those purses was too thick, which I already knew. And they have a little bit thinner. They have in all different sizes of thread. They also have leather. I bought a huge sheet of leather, I mean, this big, for $20. I mean, I'll be able to make those coin purses until I get sick of making them for $20. So Michael's is not the ideal place to go buy leather. This is another thing of leather you can buy at Michael's. It's a little bit thicker leather. It's like a six ounce. They don't, they don't, when you buy it at Michael's, they don't tell you any of that stuff because they, you know, they're not looking at it from a leather crafting type of person, I guess. But this is uh, three and a half inches by 9.1 inches. It's a thicker leather, so it, it, um, it makes a little bit uh, thicker purse. And you can also stamp, you know, you see a lot of stamp leather. You can buy their little stamping tools and stamp in it. But what I think so interesting about using leather on a scroll saw, A, is we can cut out as many of them as almost as we want at a time. Most leather cutters are cutting their patterns out using knives. And it's a very slow process. So we have the ability to cut multiples of them out. Plus we can add fretwork to the pattern that they can't eat as easily do as we can. So if you had a purse, you know, that was this size and you did a custom rose pattern on the front as prep work, I mean, that would look pretty neat in my, in my opinion. I do these exactly, can you get in here a little closer? Let me get this apart. I do these exactly the same way I do the other patterns. 
there's a sandwich of Baltic birch. And in this case, I've got two pieces of leather in here. I would put the pattern on right here. I take the piece over to my drill press and use a 7 16th inch drill bit. And I discovered that that's the best drill bit for this size needle and for this thick thread. So that's, you know, the drill bit. So I go ahead and drill all the holes for the stitching so I don't have to punch them. They make punches when you get into leather. They make punches, you know, to put the holes in before you do the stitching. But I just drilled them right at the drill press. It was really fast. Where'd my exacto knife do? I tried to stab you with. When you get done and you're ready to stitch this together, see this this mess on here? This happens every time you cut it. The little pieces of wood stay in there. You can rub it off, but if you've got a compressor or some canned air, this gets rid of it really quick. <laughs> helps get it out of the holes. So then you take these two pieces of leather, put them together like this, and then you can do your stitching. And on saddle stitching, and I have no idea what I'm talking about now, this is in the last couple of days I've learned this. You, come, you go through one hole, you come through the next, and you go all the way around until you get to the end, and then you back up and you do every other one again all the way back. So you get a saddle stitch that looks like what you see on those little purses that are going around. Um, normally, and I'm learning this slowly but surely, normally when you're going to do stitching in leather, you actually take a scraper and you put a line through this so the thread gets set down inside the leather a little bit. I mean, there's a lot to learn in leather. This, this is to me what makes this so exciting is because I think we can take the scroll saw and leather crafting and put them together and come up with something unique. And plus, I think we can, because we can cut so many, I think we have a pretty good tool for doing it. There's two types of saddle stitching that I've learned. There's a single needle and there's a double needle. And the double needer, needle is faster. But I had enough trouble handling one needle without hurting myself, so I stayed with one needle. But anyway, this wax thread works really well. When you're, when you're doing your stitching, it seems to hold in the holes really well. I guess that's why they make it like that. Uh, there's a lot to learn. I've, I've found out real quick there's a lot to learn in leather work. But you can buy all this all this stuff at, at uh, Michael's and over at Tandy they have scrap bins of their cutoffs. Yeah, look at, look at, look at, look at Brent. She's, yeah. Brent, she's looking at her <laughs> She found your scrap bin. That right there, that was $5. Yeah, so Think of how many projects you can make out of that for $5. That's a lot of projects. The whole the whole bag it's five dollars a pound. Now you got to go through and pick out the ones that are messed up. You know some of them look better than others. Steve, what blade are you using to cut the leather? The leather I almost use nothing but the two aught. Anything bigger than a two aught, um, well it catches. But also what happens with the two aught, which is really neat, when you get done making a leather project and you've got edges right here like this, there's a tool called a burnishing tool that you take and you rub along the edges of these to make it compacted or smoother. When it comes off the scroll saw, if you cut more than two or three of these at a time with a two-hot blade, it burnishes the edges of these because it's hot enough that it burnishes it and you don't need to go back and do that extra process, which is kind of neat. Guys, ladies, question? The hardest thing for me to understand is how do you find time to do everything <laughs> Luckily, my wife has left the building. <laughs> when I was still working full time at Xerox, I would work anywhere from 40 to 60, 70 hours a day, and, and we worked on call. So, yeah, it felt like a day. Um, and then I would come home at night and do this at night. And I had it down to a pretty good science where I could do it in about three hours a day. That was before I retired. Uh, so I was basically sleeping two hours a day. I have become known enough now that I'm valuable enough to these companies that they'll give me this stuff. So I can get, you know, like my CNC machine, I didn't pay for that, you know. Um, I can get a lot of this stuff given to me, so I don't have that outlay of cash that if you try to build up a shop like this, it's going to cost you some money. So I'm kind of lucky there.
So I, you know, once I get it for free, you feel obligated to learn how to use it. You know, it's like, oh, I got it, I better figure it out. But I'm a geek. I mean, you can, I mean you know, I'm going to be doing this stuff regardless. So, but yeah, right now that I'm retired, I'm probably spending eight hours a day on the blog. That's what I'm spending. And if you notice, that's always between 9 p.m. and 5 in the morning. That's when I work. That's when all the blog posts go out. So I don't sleep. <laughs> so I, I spend all day doing the things for my wife that she needs done. My wife's disabled, so I do. I get to do all the housework. And for she gets, she laughs at me because for 37 years when I was working, I'd never done a dish or cooked a dinner in my whole life. And then when she was disabled and I retired, it was my turn. It, 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 it was my turn to to turn around and. She worked way harder than I did through her career because she had a much more stressful career. And she still came home and did all the dishes and the laundry. And, and now it's her turn to sit and watch TV and me to take care of that. So I do that during the day and I do this at night. So. Any questions? Any additional questions? Comments? Things? No question, but comment. I think this is just inspiring. Yes. That's what I'm shooting for. Like, okay, what is? You know, more combinations. I know there's a few woodheads in here. And there's guys in here that are never going to touch anything but wood. And I love wood, and I appreciate that. It's the most beautiful material God ever created is wood. I mean, it's, it's not only useful, it's beautiful. I mean, it's everything you could want in a material to build things out of. I mean, just look at some of the things George puts together and those exotic woods he uses in and charge it. I mean, if there was no picture in there, just the wood is beautiful. So it's a great, it is a great material, the best material to make things out of ever. But why not get more out of a scroll saw? I'm going to make this plug. If any of this enticed you to come up with something that maybe he didn't show you, I would send him an email. It might be another thing that he hasn't thought of. Yep, I, there's lots of that out there. And I, I figure I'm going to do this at least another 10 years, so I need a lot of ideas, people. <laughs> Question over here. Yeah, um, you cut the leather with a one-on or two-on? I use a two-on for the laser, or for the leather. Oh, leather. And I thought the bigger blade would be better in the leather because I wanted to burnish the edges that cut. And I don't know if you've followed, when you cut wood on a scroll saw, a lot of times with the right blade, with a nice reverse tooth blade, it will actually sand and burnish the edge of that wood to where you've got a perfect finish when it comes off the scroll saw. Well, I kind of wanted that same technique with the leather. Uh, and you would think a bigger blade would generate more heat and would cause that, to, but it wasn't. The smaller blade did the better cut. How about cutting the wood? I've cut just about every kind of metal. I have cut aluminum, um, but it's not as easy to cut as copper. Uh, it's, it's I don't know why. Still sandwich. Still sandwich. Yeah, I use two pieces of Baltic birch or any kind of material to sandwich the material with. But last year when I was here, we talked about cutting copper, and, and uh, so I didn't want to go through that again. But yeah, you can do the same thing. And, and like these guys, Marcus has got the coin jigs. You can cut the coins, and it cut, they cut pretty easily with a scroll saw. With the right blades. Bob. Or Come Rob. back next year. If you guys will have me, I'll be here. Oh, yeah. And we uh, you got a spot you got a spot in our booth, sir. I well the only thing was my wife wasn't here to really answer that question because it really isn't up to me. <laughs> uh, we'll, no we'll way, make, shape, or form. We'll make, I'll, I'll take care of that <laughs> yeah. She puts up she puts up with a lot and uh, because I my computer room's upstairs. And my workshop's in the garage, and you would think I'd be a lot skinnier than I am, but it's about 400 trips a day. And every time we have a big open foyer, so every time I go up and down, she has to watch me creep up and down the stairs. And I'm constantly between the two because I'll do a pattern, I'll go out and chest cut, I'll do a pattern or I'll, whatever I'm working on is back and forth. So she puts up with a lot, and I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.